I think and hope this works. My name is Kai Kresse. I'm a professor at uh, Freie Universität Berlin and vice director of the Leibniz Zentrum Moderna Orient. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to our workshop today, uh, today Decentering Conceptions of Living Together, Examples from Latin America and Africa. And so based here in Berlin at the campus of the Freie Universität Berlin and the Hanak House of the Max Planck Institute, we welcome you wherever you are, whether in Africa, Latin America, or anywhere else. Um, this workshop is multilingual, and as you know, um, you will be um, uh, is live translated, as you are probably experiencing right now, uh, with simultaneous uh, translations in Spanish and Portuguese and English available. I'm briefly passing over for a brief word of welcome for my co-organizers, Juliana Streva and Sergio Costa, and then I will introduce and say a few words on the project. Uh, in the background of this workshop and the workshop itself before I introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Kai. Thank you, Mr. E sem tomar muito tempo, eu gostaria... Acho que você tem que deixar muito... Mais fácil mudar de computador. Obrigada, Kai, e obrigada a todos que estão presentes aqui. É, é uma felicidade estar abrindo esse workshop, é, contando com a presença de tantas pessoas que tem um trabalho que eu admiro muito e, e sem mais delongas eu gostaria só de agradecer pela oportunidade de estar organizando esse evento junto com Kai Kress e Sérgio Costa e dar um caloroso é, uma calorosa boas-vindas para todos os presentes tanto é, os palestrantes como os ouvintes e todo mundo que ajudou a organizar esse evento e que está agora fazendo também interpretação simultânea e eu passo a palavra agora para o professor Sérgio Costa Ya, hola a todos, todes. Eh, nada más que me pidieron para dirigirles también unas palabras en español o al menos en portugués para contemplar todos los idiomas que serán eh, utilizados en su workshop. Nada más que les dar mis eh, también muy, muy calorosas eh, buen, bienvenidas y agradecer eh, a todas y todos, todes que están participando y nos acompañando. Y bueno, y deseando a todos nosotros una excelente jornada de debates que seguramente tendremos. Kai, te devuelvo la palabra. Gracias. Thank you very much to my co-organizers. So let me say a few words on the initiative here. The research group which hosts this workshop is called Beyond Social Cohesion, Global Repertoires of Living Together, abbreviated at, as Replito. It takes marginalized and neglected repertoires of living together as its starting point to rethink social cohesion from a trans-regional perspective. Replito is an exploratory pro project funded by the Berlin University Alliance and as a Berlin-based initiative by senior researchers from the Humboldt Universität Berlin, Freie University and ZMO, we've been joining forces on, uh, in terms of our regional expertise on Asia, Europe, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East to engage with international colleagues in comparative and cross-disciplinary research. The group project explores social actors in regions of the global South and also within Europe's margins uh, how they imagine and practice communal life and create bonds. These so-called repertoires of living together continue to be negotiated and transformed 
in the context of dynamic interactions beyond localities, nation states, and regions. And so today's and tomorrow's workshop, of course, which is called Decentering Conceptions of Living Together, Latin American and African Perspectives, is organized in the framework of this interdisciplinary research project, Replito, that I just explained. Overall, we take the theoretical and practical aspects and conceptual and performative features of lesser known global repertoires of living together as our starting point to rethink social cohesion from a trans-regional perspective. In doing this, we seek to explore how thinkers, as well as ordinary social actors in Latin America and Africa imagine, practice, and theorize communal life and how they create bonds. Our central goal is to open up space for fundamental mutual questions and for substantial exchange and dialogue between thinkers from both these continental regions. Such an international dialogue is partly being pursued already, but deserves, it deserves much more stimulation and many more able participants, as it also responds to mutual curiosity and a lack of mutual knowledge from both sides. Starting from this approach, the present workshop now seeks to practice what we preach, meaning to practice a set of disciplinary trans, uh, transdisciplinary dialogues between scholars and activists from Latin America and Africa in these three consecutive panels, the one starting now and two tomorrow. Focusing on concepts of living together and political perspectives for promoting convivial cultures. Such dialogues have the potentiality to offer conceptual alternatives of thinking the social that interrogate and challenge dominant Western social theory. In particular, we are exploring the relation of repertoires linked to conceptions of personhood, conviviality, and being human, like those that have been made prominent under the term Ubuntu from South Africa, for instance, and the related widespread saying translated into English called a human being is a human being through other human beings. And this is known in different variations in wider regions. Speakers will also explore the ways in which these and related concepts have been confabulated in South American diasporas. <clears throat> For instance, in the practices of Colombo and Marmar. Please do keep in mind that this workshop is experimental. Our dialogue today does not build yet on years of mutual engagement, as might well be ideal. It's a, it is a beginning, and we're bringing into conversation here speakers who have not met before, not even virtually, and who most likely do not yet know of each other's work. So with this, uh, let me turn to our introduction of speakers for this first panel, which is called Decentering Genealogies of Living Together. And the speakers will be presented in the following order. And I will present the speakers um, more thoroughly um, in each turn of speaking. So when they appear as speakers, right? So, in, uh, so we will have them in, in, in this following order so that we jump from Africa to Latin America and back to Africa. So our first speaker will be uh, Reginald Odo from Kenya, where he's based at the University of Nairobi. Our second speaker will be Flavia Rios from Brazil, where she's at the Universidade Federal Fluminense. And our third speaker will be Sanya Osha from Nigeria, but based in Cape Town, South Africa. So with this, I'm now introducing our first speaker, Dr. Reginald Odo who has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Nairobi and uh, has been teaching philosophy there for a long time. In 1992, he became the first person with total vis visual disability to be appointed to a substantive teaching position. And he is now a senior lecturer in the philosophy department of the University of Nairobi. He has special interests in African philosophy, political philosophy, ethics, the research rights of persons with disabilities, and philosophy of religion. 
He uh, was the founding editor in chief of the revived philosophy journal Thought and Practice that had originally been found in the late 60s, early 70s, and a co editor of the volume Odera Uruka in the 21st century that appeared in 2018. With this, I call upon Reginald Odor, please, to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, I'm just trying to get to share my uh, my screen. Can you see me? Can you see my slides? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, uh, Odor. Can you see my I slides? We, we see the slide. Is it shared by Great. us? Thank Great. you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was sharing them here. Um, so if you see them, that's good. Uh, thank you very much, Kai, for the opportunity to address this um, gathering today. And I particularly thank my friend Kai Kresse because I am here because he linked me up with the organizers of this, um, of this uh, panel. Uh, he's been a friend for many years. I thank uh, also uh, Juliana and Sergio. We haven't met, but I am sure we've met online now. And uh, I have slightly changed um, the title of my paper to become Manifestations of Communalism in Luo Sayings, Proverbs and Songs, <clears throat> Conceptions of Living Together Outside or Beyond Ubuntu. And um, I will be covering quite a range of issues, an introduction there, Ubuntu as an African communalist philosophy, African communalism in politics and scholarship before Ubuntu, a sample communalist Luo kinship term, sample communalist Luo, uh, Luo sayings and expressions, uh, sample communalist sentiments in Luo songs, and then on these two items to do with the liberal democracy, I think I will skip in the interest of time, except to make very short remarks. And then I will talk about some sample, uh, samples of endogenous democratic innovations in Africa before I um, uh, make some concluding remarks. Um, by way of introduction, I would say that a major debate in social theory is that between advocates of the preeminence of the individual and proponents of the preeminence of the society. This is what some will call liberalism versus communalism or liberalism versus communitarianism. Um, a substantial number of African and Africanist scholars agree that African societies are by and large communalistic. They emphasize group life more than individual uh, rights. Yet there are communalist elements in individualist societies and individualist aspects in communalist ones. Individuality and communality are not watertight notions or experiences. Um, Communalism is not distinctively African. It is important to mention that. It is not distinctly African, but is rather a characteristic of traditional societies all over the world. As Marcel Fafjamps uh, observes, in pre-industrial societies throughout the world, which would include even Western Europe, there are um, solidarity bonds among members of the same family kinship, group, or village, manifesting in ways such as labor uh, invitations and other forms of uh, manpower assistance uh, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, manpower assistance for the sick and the old, uh, cost-free land and livestock loans, the care of children that parents cannot support, gifts, food transfers, 
and the credit uh, without interest. These things were in all traditional societies. So we are not talking essentialism here, but it is just that industrialization has not deepened uh, in Africa so that we still enjoy a communalist outlook quite a bit. Now, I want to look at Ubuntu as an African communalist philosophy, and I would mention that the term Ubuntu, uh, as many may know, comes from the so-called Bantu languages. I use the word so-called very deliberately, uh, and these are the languages of Sub-Saharan Africa, all of which refer to a person using a version of the word which is suffixed by the vowel to, do, to, um, or to. Thus, we, we have Muntu, Zulu, Muthu among some communities in Malawi, Moto among some communities in the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mundu in several uh, Kenyan languages, and Muntu in Kiswahili. Ubuntu is often expressed in the um, Nguni Ndebele saying, Muntungu Muntungabantu. A person is a person through other persons. And it is important to emphasize that, that the focus is person, not human being, because the person is the product of socialization. The, the human being is the process of, is the product of biology. And so the, 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 the important thing there is that we are who we are as persons within society because of the process of socialization. Um, scholars of linguistics inform us that grammatically the word comes from the root un, from the root into person or human being with the class 14 ubu prefix used to form abstract nouns so that the term is exactly parallel, parallel in semantic content to the abstract noun humanity. Ubuntu can also be transliterated as humanness. We find variations of the term Ubuntu, as I've already said, in different languages. Um, in practice, Ubuntu has come to refer to a humanitarian outlook, humanism or socialism, all presumably in contradistinction to capitalism. Um, and I will then move on to my next point, conscious that my time is flying. And um, I will point out that in line with the idea of Ubuntu, the term, uh, in, term in, in line with the idea of sharing, the term Ubuntu has come, has been further popularized uh, by a variant of an open source computer operating system which adopted the name Ubuntu Linux in October 2004 to highlight the fact that the system was available free of charge. It was being shared and uh, Ubuntu is about sharing. Now I want to talk about African communalism in politics and scholarship before Ubuntu because Ubuntu became very uh, popular um, with the end of apartheid. And our brothers and sisters from South Africa popularized it. Uh, and it caught on in a way uh, that some may not have foreseen. And it, sometimes people have the impression uh, that um, the whole, that um, Ubuntu um, is, or is the only word that can express African communalism. Yet in the 1950s and 1960s, long before the fall of apartheid, both Kwame Nkrumah, first president of Ghana, and Julius Nyerere, first president of Tanzania, emphasized that Africans are communalistic in outlook so that capitalism is alien to them. And in the early 1970s, at the height of Julius Nyerere's experiment with Ujamaa, uh, which is translated as familyhood or African socialism, Radio Tanzania had a, had a promotional piece just before, just after every prime news broadcast, and it said, Ujamani Utu, Ube Parini Unyama, which is Kiswahili for socialism is humanitarian, uh, capitalism is brutish. 
Now, in 1969, Kenyan theologian John S. Beatty emphasized kinship uh, based communalism among African peoples with the saying, I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. And the Swahili have long said, Mtu ni watu, which is simply a person is persons, meaning that personhood develops, as I said, in a social uh, context. I would also like to emphasize that um, um, in the novel, things fall apart. Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe includes a famous passage where an elder points out that someone prepares a feast, not because his kinsfolk do, kinsfolk do not have food in their barns, but because they are brothers. And in 1975, Nigerian social scientist Peter Eke analyzed contemporary African politics as comprised of two publics, the primordial public inspired by indigenous communalistic values based on kinship systems among various cultural groups and the civic public imposed by colonialism. Remember this in 1975, before Ubuntu was in vogue. And in 1993, Nigerian social scientist Claude Ake emphasized that ethnic loyalty can be adequately understood as a survival technique based on the communalistic outlook of African peoples thrust into colonially imposed contemporary multicultural polities. So in fact, Ake was emphasizing that ethnicity has never been a problem in Africa. It is social scientists who think it is. It is those who push um, the configuration of the world system in terms of the imperial map, who may think it is, but taken seriously, uh, or it is not itself a problem. And this then brings me to um, sharing sample communalist Luo kinship terms. Just to illustrate that uh, the Luo who are not Bantu and therefore do not use the word uh, Ubuntu or Ubuntu actually are communalistic. For example, the term brother in Luo is Omin, and it literally means son of my mother. You can see that there is the effort to involve others in the relationship, not just the two siblings. And the sister is Nyamin, daughter of my mother. Father's brother, which in English is uncle, is Wunwa, our father. My father's brother is my father. And my mother's sister is also Minwa, my mother. And um, um, for, when, I, when I, 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 one wants to uh, refer, a wife wants to refer, a woman wants to refer to her husband fondly, she says, or Minwa, my mother's son-in-law. And uh, a man, uh, a fond reference to my wife would be uh, Yura, my sister-in-law, because the wife belongs to the clan, not merely to her husband. No shared conjugal rights intended, thank you very much, which is what some European thoughts have, uh, ladies have thought we were saying when we they get married around here. It's just that we believe that when a woman gets married in a community, we will all benefit from all the, the resources that she will uh, put at the disposal of the community. I want to look now at some sample communalist Luo sayings and expressions. Um, one, ngato okliel rekende, means no one shaves himself or herself. You need someone to shave you. Incidentally, I try to shave myself, but at the end, I asked my wife to just check whether I did it correctly. Another is Jachien Kende Kajajuok, very dynamically translated as whoever eats alone is a wizard. Yeah, and a wizard here is an antisocial uh, character. Another of the sayings here is Chamgidnyawa du Katatin, eat with your fellow, with your kinsman or kinswoman, even if it is little. And when a Luo cries for help, when he or she is shocked, he or she says, Yawa or Jowa, both of which mean my kinsfolk, uh, in contrast to an English uh, person who may say, Oh, my, notice my is singular, it's mine. 
but we are crying, my people. Now, Alua praises himself or herself in reference to his or her kinsfolk. I am Joma. I am the son of um, I am the son of the great farmers. It's not just I am me and I have accomplished and I have a PhD. It is me in relationship to the accomplishments of the community. Now, where there are no blood ties, kinship relations are expressed still in terms of in-law terms because the persons concerned are potential in-laws. A lady who meets me on a bus stop, at a bus stop, and she's elderly will call me, how are you, my son-in-law? Because I could marry her daughter. So that kinship still remains. So Aluo asks, have you eaten lunch? While an English person asks, have you had your lunch? We think I don't have to make it my lunch. It's just lunch that I happen to have the privilege of eating. In a car, a new driver asks, have you closed the door on your side? While an, an English one asks, have you closed your door? And we think it's mine, it's not my door. How would a, a door on a car be mine at all? Okay. Now I go to some sample communalist sentiments in Luo's songs, and I see, Kai, that I have about four minutes right. Um, so I'll be faithful. Now, love songs praise women in reference to their close relatives and their clans. You don't just focus on her eyes and her hair. You do that, yes, but you also say, oh, daughter of such and such a clan. That clan gave birth to such a beautiful person. And um, some political songs appeal to the need to promote the welfare of the Luo people. Uh, let us vote so that our welfare is promoted. Other songs express solidarity with other oppressed peoples, non Luos. I think of D.O. Owino Misiani, who wrote an amazing song condemning the dictatorship of Ida Min Dada and really paid, uh, expressing pain that the people in Uganda were going through such terrible things. I will skip uh, the strengths of liberal democracy and I will skip um, the main objections to liberal democracy in the interest of time, but I will share with you samples of endogenous democratic innovations in Africa, because a number of us are unhappy with the liberal democracy precisely because it is highly individualist and many of our people are highly communalist. And so a number of thinkers have, have shared what they see as alternatives to liberal democracy, which is really, as I usually call it, the political wing of capitalism. Now, Kwame Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere uh, proposed socialism. Uh, Nyerere called it African socialism. My academic mentor, A.O. Mojola, proposes radical decentralization. We give up on strong states and allow different cultural communities to pursue governance from their own, uh, from the point of their worldviews. Another of my colleagues, Ludeki Chue, uh, proposes a synthesis of indigenous African political systems and liberal democracy, as has happened in Somaliland, where we have an upper house of parliament uh, occupied by clan elders and a lower uh, chamber of parliament, which is occupied by people elected in the typical liberal democratic model. Achi Mafeje from South Africa proposed three elements, focus on the sovereignty of the people, social justice rather than formal rights. You know, bills of rights never tell you how you learn your bread. They're just saying you have a right to this and that. And equitable access to productive resources. And Kwasi Viredu from Ghana proposes a no party consensual democracy. And Reginald Odur, before you here, proposes a culturally based federation for Kenya so that you have different cultural groups. We usually call them ethnic groups uh, being federal units. I want to conclude then in the last one minute by making the following observations. Ubuntu is a Southern African expression of communalism, an outlook that is characteristic of traditional African societies 
as indeed of traditional societies elsewhere on the globe. Peoples of Africa who are not Bantu may not feel comfortable using the term Ubuntu to describe their communalistic viewpoints. There is therefore a danger of transforming Ubuntu into a hegemonic term and outlook if it is imposed on non-Bantu peoples of Africa. There is also a danger of a hasty generalization in using the term Ubuntu to describe all shades of communalism among the diverse, I might say highly diverse, cultural and linguistic peoples of Africa. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Udua. I think we still have the PowerPoint. I will try and get it out. My machine is, is uh, doing things. So thank you very much for this inspiring talk. We should maybe just add that uh, the Luo, right? There are the people of Western Kenya where you're obviously yourself a part of that group. And just to note, yeah, we, we skipped the critique of liberal democracy that you basically built or had underpinned through your descriptions from the Luo setting. So we could recourse back to them in discussion. But we will, thank you very much again. We will now have our second speaker. I forgot to say that in the beginning that we shall have our three presentations of 20 minutes now in uh, following each other, jumping between the continents, as I said. So we will now, without, any, without further ado, come to our second speaker, Flavia Rios. Flavia Rios, she is a professor of sociology at the Universidade Federal Fluminense in Brazil, Rio. Currently, she coordinates the management of racial equality project in the city of Niterói, I hope. I probably don't pronounce that right. Yeah. She uh, wrote and has co-organized three books. The one is Leila Gonzalez, which was published in 2010. A second one, Negros na Cidades Brasilianas, Brasileiras, which was published in 2018. And a third book on Afro-Latino American feminism, which was just recently published now in 2020. Welcome, Flavia. It's great to have you with us from afar. Um, and the floor is yours now for the next 20 minutes. If there are uh, people in the audience uh, they can, who have questions, they can already post questions into the chat for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Olá, muito obrigada, Kay, pela apresentação, obrigada ao professor Sérgio Costa pelo convite, obrigada a todas envolvidas, Melaine, pela, pelo apoio para esta apresentação e para este evento. Eu fico muito, não só agradecida, mas honrada por poder participar deste workshop com Reginaldo Odor e Sânia Ochoa. É um prazer estar com vocês, é, especialmente para apresentar o pensamento, a obra é, de uma intelectual latino-americana, Lélia Gonçalves, que tem umas reflexão, reflexões muito, muito importantes sobre a região, sobre colonialismo, sobre o capitalismo no, na América Latina, sobre as condições das mulheres negras é, nesta região do país, uh, do, do mundo, por, e também muito influenciada pelo pensamento de africano, é, norte-americano e também latino-americano e brasileiro. Eu vou tentar compartilhar a minha tela, eu fiz um experimento antes, não sei se nós vamos conseguir, é, eu sei que é, vocês talvez estejam vendo a tela, eu vou tentar colocar do começo e ampliar, 
nesse momento, mas não sei se vocês conseguem visualizar. Eu não sei se alguém pode me dar um feedback sobre esta, essa qualidade do compartilhamento. Sim, yes. yes, si? ok. Eu, e conseguem ver a passagem? Sim. Sim, conseguem ver, ok. Um, então, eu gostaria de fazer uma apresentação sobre a trajetória desta intelectual no Brasil. Nós estamos num processo é, de investimento nas personalidades, nos autores afrodescendentes, negros, seu pensamento, seus pensamentos, suas produções intelectuais, artísticas e suas contribuições para a, a produção de conhecimento nesta região. Nesse sentido, o trabalho da Lélia Gonzalez é muito importante, muito central neste momento, inclusive, da nosso país, em que o autoritarismo e condições muito dramáticas de vida com a pandemia, crescimento da violência e pobreza. É, este, esta produção de Gonzalez tem encontrado uma recepção importante no país, especialmente nesta última década. Eu queria compartilhar com vocês é, a autora do seu a biografia, aspectos da sua biografia, porque tratam é, do modo como ela é, viveu a experiência colonial no Brasil. Ah, três categorias importantes que ajudam a entender não só o Brasil, mas a América Latina como um todo e sociedades que experimentaram o colonialismo. A primeira delas, a ideia de assimilação, Muitas pessoas negras, especialmente no Brasil, um padrão dominante na América Latina para a integração das populações indígenas e negras nas nações, nas jovens nações, foi a experiência de assimilação cultural, estética, intelectual, demográfica e uh, algumas ideologias próprias dessa região como a ideia de democracia racial e de embranquecimento. Nesta foto nós podemos ver a Lélia Gonzalez como uma mulher que se imaginava assimilada, incorporada à nação brasileira, como uma professora de uma boa, de uma grande instituição educacional no Brasil. Essa imagem de país vai ser questionada por ela e por outros intelectuais da sua geração, e é assim que surgem boa parte das produções inovadoras, criativas e emancipatórias desta geração. Aqui nós já vemos uma outra imagem completamente diferente em termos de ação coletiva, de pertencimento, de vínculo, de relações sociais, que é a construção de movimentos sociais, num contexto ainda autoritário, porque nós vivíamos numa ditadura, vários países latino-americanos viviam em situação de ditadura militar, e a Lélia Gonzalez é, escreveu boa parte da sua produção intelectual sob essa ditadura. Inclusive, ela foi vigiada a dossiês, a informações feitas pela polícias, por agentes políticos, da polícia, é, em relação à sua produção, em relação ao seu ativismo, em relação à sua circulação no país. A Lélia Gonzalez é uma das fundadoras dos movimentos negros, antirracistas, que lutam contra as desigualdades, discriminação, racismos no país, neste contexto em que as ações coletivas não tinham espaço, não tinham possibilidades de protestos, de articulação públicas. É neste momento em que eles se organizam, é, muito influenciados por, por pensamentos de várias partes do planeta, especialmente as lutas por independência dos países africanos, intelectuais, é, africanos de língua portuguesa, que falavam língua portuguesa, mas não apenas. Lélia Gonzalez é uma autora 
que foi bastante influenciada também por autoras como Angela Davis ou outras intelectuais que chamamos hoje do Black Feminism, e Gonzalez é, também tinha uma influência forte das autoras latino-americanas. Nesta foto nós vemos aqui várias representações é, que dizem respeito às imagens que esses, essa população negra organizada e esses intelectuais produziam acerca do que viria a ser, o que gostariam que fosse as suas referências, as referências anticoloniais, referências não europeias, então esses são elementos muito importantes para a formação Destas, dessa geração. Mais do que isso... Não. Sim, é porque eu mudei. Agora está no três? Você consegue ver? Ai. É, eu acho que... É, não, eu, eu troquei, mas não... Na verdade, acho que não, você não está conseguindo visualizar. Eu estou trocando. Acho que não está mudando, né? Então, vou ver se assim vai. Foi? Ah, é porque você está vendo o resumo... Ah, entendi. Tá, é porque você está... Agora? Tá, é porque eu não estou conseguindo ampliar para vocês. Obrigada. Me desculpem por vocês não terem visto a, a um slide que eu estava me referindo... É, esta é um, uma, uma, um outro momento da vida da Gonzalez, sobre o qual falei há pouco, um momento de organização política dos movimentos negros, movimentos antirracistas, e especialmente dos movimentos de mulheres, mulheres negras no país. É, a gente tem uma produção, a produção da Lélia Gonzalez é muito marcada por muitos temas centrais no enfrentamento do, dos efeitos do colonialismo nos países latino-americanos, em particular no Brasil. Um dos pontos centrais é a, que, a questão da violência, especialmente da violência policial contra pessoas negras, especialmente homens negros, jovens negros, e todo o movimento de mulheres, mães, parentes, irmãs, filhas de pessoas que são assassinadas pela polícia ou que estão em condições de vulnerabilidade nas periferias ou em lugares em que a, o Estado age de, de forma extremamente violenta. A Gonzalez, ainda neste contexto de ditadura militar, escrevia bastante sobre estas temáticas e era bastante influenciada pelas ideias, pela produção do movimento negro unificado, que é um movimento muito importante em termos da transformação da linguagem antirracista no Brasil. É, o movimento negro unificado ele se forma em 1978, ainda sob a ditadura militar, e tem influências de autores intelectuais e ativistas como o Abdias do Nascimento, que é o maior intelectual é, internacionalmente conhecido a partir aqui do Brasil. É, nós temos, é, eu trouxe para vocês é, uma referência importante da circulação internacional dessa autora é, em Nairobi, no Quênia, para referir não só a circulação, as viagens internacionais que a autora fazia, mas também o seu intenso fluxo, o seu intensa comunicação com autores, com a produção intelectual é, africana, neste caso em particular é uma conferência da ONU em que várias mulheres negras e também feministas estiveram nesta conferência para tratar das questões relativas às políticas das mulheres, é, fazia-se dez anos da década da mulher, na verdade era a finalização da década da mulher, e a Lélia Gonzalez, junto com uma parlamentar brasileira, importante até hoje, Benedita da Silva, encontra-se nesta foto abraçada, e também, noutra foto, a Lélia Gonzalez abraçada com a pessoas jovens, mulheres, quenianas, 
Então, esta é uma foto muito importante na memória da construção desta intelectual. Por outro lado, trouxe aqui também uma representação do ativismo da Gonzalez junto à América Latina, ela tinha um investimento de circulação, de participação em congressos, em eventos, de leitura dos intelectuais é, latino-americanos e caribenhos. Então, essa é uma referência importante deste investimento da autora. E, por fim, uma imagem referente à produção intelectual da Gonzalez com o Carlos Razenbaug, um autor argentino que viveu muitos anos no Brasil. Queria mostrar, quero mostrar para vocês um pouco sobre os extratos da fragmentos, na verdade, são dois livros aqui que nós temos, é, produzidos por Lélia Gonzalez, além de um conjunto muito diverso de artigos, textos, produzidos em língua inglesa, francesa e em espanhol também. Atualmente, nós reunimos uma, em sua, a sua obra neste livro, que são os escritos da Lélia Gonzalez. Agora passo a me referir especificamente ao pensamento desta autora. Quero interromper esta, esse, esse compartilhamento para me referir à contribuição da Lélia Gonzalez como intelectual para pensar uh, numa perspectiva decolonial, uh, interseccional, onde suas contribuições melhor se encaixam. Lélia Gonzalez é uma autora que nos legou muitos termos, ideias e, sobretudo, uma teoria sobre a méfrica ladina, que é o modo como ela é, passa a chamar esta região continental, caribenha também, a se, para se referir especialmente às comunidades indígenas, as etnicidades indígenas e afrodescendentes nesta região. E também a ideia da Méfrica Ladina é uma ideia anti-imperialista, que é um jeito de afirmação cultural, intelectual, econômica, em relação aos Estados Unidos. Neste sentido, Lélia Gonzalez elabora a ideia de amefricanidade, que seria como tratar de nós mesmos, como tratar desta região, não apenas como uma região é, marcada pela presença europeia, pelo colonialismo europeu, mas, sobretudo, marcada pelas contribuições das populações originárias desta região. Vale uma nota biográfica, Lélia Gonzalez é, tem por origem é, de um lado, o lado paterno afrodescendente, de um homem negro, operário, do seu lado materno, uma origem indígena. Ela carregava essas características como sendo características fundamentais para pensar as linguagens de transformação e subversão da cultura é, no país. O pensamento da Lélia Gonzalez é bastante influenciado por abordagens e teorias marxistas, é também muito influenciado pelo feminismo, muito influenciado por uma perspectiva anticolonial. É nessa construção, e aí nesta abordagem é, anticolonial, eu destacaria o pensamento do Franz Fanon e de Amé Cézé, que são autores que ela lia com muita, é, muito rigor, com muito cuidado, e era muito forte na sua elaboração. E Gonçalves tem se apresentado atualmente como uma intelectual interseccional, porque pensa a dominação e a exploração em sociedades capitalistas, levando em consideração uma interconexão sistêmica entre esses três sistemas que mutuamente criariam, gerariam desigualdades, bem como identidades coletivas. Gonzalez também, por sua vez, não tratou de fazer um diagnóstico original, crítico, à experiência colonial e seus efeitos perversos, 
na contemporaneidade. Ela tratou de criar essas categorias que seriam, na sua própria leitura, categorias subversivas. Daí a ideia de americanidade como tra tratar de superar as invisibilidades, as culturas diversas, indígenas e afrodescendentes na região. É interessante dizer que não se trata de apenas uma teoria panafricanista, porque, afinal de contas, Gonzales tem um enraizamento e uma crítica de, e, e pensa desde a América Latina, pensa a América Latina como lugar de referência e não um retorno à África, como muitos intelectuais da sua geração escreveram ou pensaram. Um elemento importante e central na sua produção é a reflexão sobre gênero. A ideia de améfrica ladina e a ideia de améfricanidade, ela tem que levar em consideração as desigualdades e as hierarquias de gênero, os papéis de gênero e as condições a que as mulheres negras estão submetidas, mulheres indígenas, mulheres negras, mulheres racializadas nos contextos latino-americanos. A Gonzalez tem uma, uma contribuição no que diz respeito à construção da figura da categoria pretuguês, que é uma categoria que ela entende como sendo uma categoria subversiva, cuja agente principal é, do pretuguês seriam as mulheres negras, desde o contexto do Brasil colônia, o Brasil num, em situações de senzalas é, e casa grandes, até neste período é, moderno, capitalista, em que as mulheres atuando como empregadas domésticas, como trabalhadoras, seriam responsáveis pela transmissão de conhecimento, cultura, linguagem, perspectivas, visões não dominantes, ou seja, não eurocêntricas. E esta percepção e essa categoria, na verdade, pretuguês, não, é, não trata apenas das, dos vocábulos africanos, da língua ban, das línguas bantas, na na sua, a sua presença na nossa região, mas também refere-se a fonemas, a formas de ser, formas de se comportar e, e outras formas de pensar que atravessariam independentemente do colonialismo. Ainda que o colonialismo fosse violento, esta forma subversiva do pretuguês se manteria. O pretuguês, então, seria uma, algo constitutivo dessa métrica ladina, assim como todas as outras formas de subversão que as, os grupos sociais indígenas, afrodescendentes e grupos racializados na região criaram para manter sua cultura a despeito das violentas formas de dominação colonial. A ideia de améfrica ladina, por fim, traz uma, em sua construção uma possibilidade, um horizonte emancipatório, porque Gonzales traz em sua contribuição intelectual a reflexão sobre as formas de organização das mulheres indígenas e negras e as suas cosmologias, as suas formas de, de, de pensar, de reagir às formas coloniais do passado e do presente. É nesse sentido que ela se envolveu muito diretamente com as comunidades, com as pessoas que vivem em favelas, em morros, mesmo ela não sendo mais uma moradora de favela ou de morro, mesmo ela tendo vivido uma experiência de ascensão social, de mobilidade, tendo viajado o mundo, tendo circulado em muitos espaços, inclusive nos espaços de classe média, elites brasileiras, a autora entendia que uma luta por igualdade, uma luta emancipatória, verdadeiramente emancipatória, não estaria restrita à democracia liberal, tampouco a uma lógica capitalista, ela exigiria um esforço muito grande do entendimento e das formas de superação do colonialismo e do patriarcado. Então, toda a produção de Lélia Gonzalez é no sentido de construção dessas categorias que, de um lado, dizem respeito a diagnósticos dos processos sociais de longa duração, de outro, 
dizem respeito às formas diversas de emancipação e à possibilidade de viver junto. A possibilidade de viver junto em sociedades democráticas, a possibilidade de viver junto a partir de um pluralismo étnico, cultural, e é por isso que a categoria de americanidade não é uma categoria linguística limitada a um, a um grupo linguístico, é, então, portanto, é, atravessa muitas nacionalidades, não, é, não está ancorado numa nação em particular, não está ancorado num hemisfério em particular, ele diz respeito a quem nós somos nesta região é, Américas, especialmente, especialmente a América Latina. Eu quero é, finalizar dizendo que me parece que essa produção da Lélia Gonzalez é, ela encontra um ambiente oportuno nesse momento em que nós temos as teorias decoloniais e interseccionais sendo debatidas no mundo, sendo assim as categorias, o pensamento e essa teoria sobre a mefricanidade é um dos exemplos que nós temos e trazemos a partir da Lélia Gonzalez. Muito obrigada por sua atenção. Thank you very much for this rich and exciting introduction into this very important thinker. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, sorry for the initial difficulties, but we got uh, all the slides then. So thanks a lot, Flavia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will return to this also about uh, possible overlaps and comparisons in the Q&A. For now, I will turn to our third speaker this evening, which is Sanya Osha. And uh, Sanya Osha, as I said, is currently based in Cape Town at the University of Cape Town in the Center of Hum Institute for Humanities, where he is a senior fellow. He holds a PhD in philosophy and uh, is from Nigeria, now has been quite long based in South Africa. He has published extensively on anthropology, cultural studies, knowledge system of Africa, and the politics of the West African region, and also social, political, and cultural realities of Southern Africa, in addition to the debates on African philosophy. Some of his major publication include, publications include the book Quasi Viredo and Beyond, then uh, from 2005, the book Post Ethno Philosophy from 2011, and Dani Nabudera's uh, Africology, A Quest for African Holism from 2018. Sanya, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours now. Hello, everyone. Thank you, um, Kai and um, Juliana, for um, facilitating this very important forum and um, workshop. And I'd like to thank, um, yes, the other organizers, um, Sergio and the institutes in Berlin who were behind the organization of this important uh, workshop. Uh, I'm um, very honored to be here to talk about a very important um, topic as well, um, decentering genealogies of living together. Now for my presentation for my talk, I'll be basing most of my reflections, the most, I'll be drawing most of my reflections from um, a, an article I published a few months ago, earlier this year called, um, um, African unity from African unity from below, uh, a view from South Africa, which was published in the uh, review of African political economy to mark the occasion of Africa on May 25th. Now, um, this brief article was trying to reflect on the realities of living as a foreign of the um, um, foreign. African migrant or yes, migrant in South Africa and contemporary South Africa. The challenges, the joys, the, 
and perhaps also, and most of all, yes, the sorrows of, of, of having to cope with um, a quite complex terrain, to, uh, socially, culturally, and also politically. Um, the realities of being a, a migrant, an African migrant in South Africa, broke into world consciousness during the 2008 xenophobic violence, uh, which broke out across South Africa, in which um, foreign nationals were attacked, black foreign nationals especially, were attacked by their South African, um, you know, um, you know, um, South African nationals um, in this case, uh, on the basis of their foreignness. Now, it would appear that given the sort of violent context and contestations that have been occurring, even before 2008, when the crisis got to an ahead, there were um, tensions, there were tensions, constant tensions about, uh, about the notion of the Amakwari query, which is the foreigner, Amakwari query. Um, and this was a very derogatory term for um, foreign nationals, especially black ones from other parts of Africa. But we have to put the perspective, the into perspective, the arrival of these foreigners. Um, in 1994, we saw the demise of the, the official demise of apartheid as a political system. And during the inaugural, after the inauguration of Nelson Mandela, he invited Africans from all over the continent and beyond to come and join South Africans in building a new nation, in building an African identity. His, his successor, um, President Thabo Mbeki, dwelled on certain concepts of, of the African personhood the African personality in which he, he, he gave his famous speech in night, delivered his famous speech in 1996 called, I am an African, in which he defined the African and, and how he should be viewed by his fellow Africans and non-Africans alike. He went on to explore the possibilities of inaugurating um, an African renaissance in which African value systems, African worldviews, African philosophies, African cultural systems, African political systems were supposed to have a, re, a revitalization or at least a reconsideration um, with a view to building the sort of African uh, African continent that he 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 wanted he wanted that's Tabo Mbeki. So within this um, two regimes or two um, presidents, that's President Mandela on the one hand and President Tabo Mbeki on the other hand, an influx of South of Africans, other Africans from other countries, South African miracle, uh, miracle. In actuality, because South Africans have been engrossed for so long in the fight against apartheid, there were certain trades in which they didn't have enough numbers. There were certain professions in which they didn't have enough numbers. And there were also many skills in which they, they needed the help and the assistance of their fellow Africans from other countries. And so they, he, the Africans see that this goal and they saw Africa and South Africa as a new frontier and if a new frontier, not only economically, but also culturally and polit more important politically, the idea of the, between um, Mbeki on the one hand and Mandela even before him on the, on the other was to extend the South African miracle to other Africans. So that this political rainbowism, this um, racial rainbowism, cultural rainbowism would include other Africans in building the new South African nation. And so, yes, so they heeded the call.
My colleague and friend, Reginald had not spoke, spoken on a very important concept, which I don't think I will dwell much on, even though I needed, I would have needed to do so, the concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu means I am, um, I, 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 I am because you are, I am because you are, and therefore we are, which um, speaks to the communi communal eth ethos that is found in virtually all um, parts of Black Africa or, or the African continent as a whole and beyond, because I mean, the concept also can be found in um, very active in Afro Brazilian, Afro Cuban circles, Afro Brazilian circles, in Afro Cuban circles, it's called Lukumi. I am you, and, and you are me, Lukumi. And that's what, yeah, which it's derived from the um, from traditional um, um, Yoruba Orisha spirituality or forms of worship. You know, um, um, this is how um, descendants of Yoruba um, ethnicity in Cuba recognized each other through um, certain cultural traits in which they were they were mutually recognizable. And so, so, yeah, so um, the concept of Ubuntu too is like that, not only in South Africa, but Southern Africa as a whole. So um, in the spirit of South Africa in 1994, Ubuntu became quite important in building a new society. It was also uh, a a concept that, smug, that fitted smugly with the concept of reconciliation and truth, truth and reconciliation, which was um, a program that South Africans engineered or started to heal themselves from the horrors and trauma of apartheid. That they needed to be forgiven, they needed to accept each other, and they needed to also forgive one another for the tragic and horrific circumstances they had to endure under the apartheid dispensation. Um, so that the exodus of Africans from other parts of Africa, other countries has to be seen, viewed in this context. And very rapidly, certain neighborhoods, or, uh, yeah, or perhaps not too rapidly, certain neighborhoods, certain communities in, um, in South Africa became quite nationalistic, and not quite diverse in, in, the very, in, in, in the nationalistic sense, quite diverse, culturally quite diverse, linguistically. And in, in, in more ways than not, in, very, in various ways, quite eclectic. And there were, there were melting pots of culture, of languages, of um, um, economic practices, uh, religious observances, all came to meet in certain dense communities in South Africa. Now in my article, what I focus on is a certain community found in Pretoria called Sunnyside. It's quite small, it's not a big community, but what's, what is most striking about the community is that you find nationalities from all, virtually all, um, all corners of Africa and beyond. You have Cameroonians, you have Congolese from both Congo, both uh, the, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Congo Brazzaville, uh, uh, you know, have that. You have people from Burundi, from Rwanda, from Malawi, from Namibia, from Zimbabwe, from uh, Nigeria, Ghana, um, all everywhere. And then you have Chinese um, nationals, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, living in the very small. Um, highly congested area. And this sort of communities sprang up in various parts of South Africa. One can mention 
Hillbro in Johannesburg, Belleville in, um, in Cape Town, and other city, um, communities like that. Communities that were also similar can be found or can be found in Durban, in parts of East, um, the Eastern Cape, and wherever there are economic opportunities and opportunities to, um, to develop culturally and politically and socially. Because once, they, once we can establish businesses, once we can establish certain kinds of restaurants, have certain trades that sprang up, people converge and you had these diverse practices, like I said, in, um, socially, culturally, and economically that sprang up. And Sunnyside Pretoria is one of those kinds of um, um, communities where you have this diverse, I mean, it's incredible how you know, the languages, in fact, to uh, find that you, you know, from everywhere, Tui, the Ghanaian Tui, Akan, Yoruba, Igbo, Amharic, Pretori, Afrikaans, Arabic, Mandarin, um, Luba, Lingala, all kinds of you know languages are similar. You know, in, in, in this dense um, configuration, filled with people, sounds, you know, smells, you know. Colors and colors as well. I mean, so it's so it's, a, it's, a, it's you find mini Africa's within the small congested areas. Now, after the um, the um, exit of both Mandela and Mbeki from political power. Jacob Zuma took over in, 20, in 2009, and very rapidly the political situation and economic situation started to heat, um, started to become heated up. Mbeki, as I mentioned, had been very important in furthering what he called the African Renaissance as a project. And he initiated quite a number of pro programs to see that it is realized politically across the, and then the impact is felt across the African continent. Along with Nigeria's Ulusha Gwaba and um, President Wadi of Senegal and the Egyptian president, they launched what was called NEPAD. NEPAD was supposed to create a new pact economic pact for Africa's economic development. And um, apart from that, it also was also helped to have social and cultural impact around the African continent in fostering um, social and political cohesion. Immediately he left office, that program became dormant. His successor, Jacob Zuma, did not take it up, take it up and I think he had a different political vision and agenda for South Africans and Africans as a whole. He, from his actions, from his deeds, from his, um, and also from his um, author, utterances, mm -hmm. it became clear that his um, dispensation would be char characterized by South Africans first. South Africa for South Africans and not for Africans. Immediately, we began to see the um, emasculation, economic emasculation of foreign African foreign nationals in terms of not they're not getting um, prop, uh, jobs within the formal sector. It was an unwritten rule that, um, you know, um, hurdles should be put in the way of foreign nationals who um, wanted to secure jobs in the South African economic market. It became more difficult. Um, it became also um, very difficult in, in the informal sector to, to, um, to survive. In spite of that, Africans from other areas 
manage. They tried in, on the ground economies in informal setups in as street as as either hairdressers, barbers, or you know um, street vendors, sellers of fruits and vegetables root, uh, by the roadside, and all a whole range of informal activities and trades that were not fully regulated within the African South African economic space. They found ways to thrive and support, sustain themselves. But it was clear that increasingly this was becoming an, a very hostile poly, social political terrain. I alluded to the um, outbreak of xenophobic um, violence which occurred in just one year before Jacob Zuma assumed office in 2018, in which 62 um, people died officially. After that, when you know things became tougher, as I mentioned, and as things became tougher, the state we grew to be more incompetent, incompetent in terms of that set delivering services, services pertaining to uh, basic housing, water electricity, um, creating a, a, a suitable um, a, um, environment, enabling environment for economic growth and development and to uh, spur and uh, to spur employment within a growing South African underclass. As this growing South African underclass became more agitated, more restless, the violence and the outbreaks of xenophobic rage grew. They became more, uh, you know, um, more rampant, more frequent. And of, of course, this exacerbated tensions. And then the figure, the much maligned figure of the Makurekwiri, the foreigner, increased. And um, what has occurred is that the foreigner had to um, negotiate a lot of variables, the legal and the legal, insider, outsider, internal, external, citizen, citizen, alien. All these are the various um, pressures and categories that this um, so-called foreigner, the Amakuri, had to negotiate and deal with minute by minute. And in, in many uh, there was a book that was published in around um, just around the same time when the xenophobic go home or die. So it was a it was a question of either you leave South Africa or you remain and die. In spite of that, in spite of the fact that there has been um, increasing urban precarity, political tensions, and social hostility directed towards the immigrant African from elsewhere. They have continued to find ways to thrive in building communities such as the one I referred to in Sunnyside, Pretoria, which are diverse and, 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 and complex and, and colorful and in which South Africans find themselves threatened in their own land. And so they had to do something to protect themselves and their identities as the case must be. And this is also further fueled by the um, utterances and deeds of politicians who cash in on these tensions to build political capital. But the real issue, the real issue facing South Africa and South African citizens as a whole is not the question of the, it's not the figure of the Amakori query or the foreign, black foreign national. It is more of the fact that there hasn't been a total dismantling of apartheid structures still embedded in contemporary South African life politically, culturally, economically. Land remains um, 
scarce and unavailable to the average South African, in which uh, the minorities still control about 72% of the, of, of the land mass. Economic power is still in the hands of the minority, you know, and also the fact that 7 million people are currently unemployed. So you have an uh, unemployment rate of almost 50% amongst black people. And the young, and they are, and they are, a lot of them are very young between the ages of say 15 and 35, you know, where they are, which should be, when they should be approaching the prime of their lives. Um, then they're not, a lot of them, even when they have the um, certain skills or education, cannot be absorbed by the employment market. And so that fuels even break more tensions, more hostility, and more disaffection amongst this huge mass of the South African unemployed. Um, and this is what is causing the tensions directed at the um, South African immigrant currently, you know, the tensions of an unreconstructed or not fully reconstructed apartheid legacy, the constraints and the tensions created by, uh, by, by economic scarcity, by um, the unavailability of opportunities, the unavailability of jobs, and the fact that said Africans remain the mass, masses of, of South Africans remain containerized in, in urban ghettos called shanty towns and town townships. And so we saw that spillover in a very shocking event in July, in which for days there was mass meeting of shops in which um, over 200 malls were burnt, they were looted and burnt, and um, in which about, um, uh, you know, um, billions of rands were lost, billions and billions, it's still being calculated how much was lost. And so these are the sort of tensions and um, um, conditions in which South Africans find themselves and immigrants in South Africa find themselves living in very grave or very um, desperate economic, uh, social, economic and political conditions in which they try to fashion life. I'll end there for now, and I'll, you know, await your questions and responses and comments. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to a very interesting uh, exchange with you. Thank you so much, Kai. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sonia, for this uh, illustrative talk on where, how, in the end, I think the point is that the, there's a resilience of a recultivation of an Ubuntu uh, that the, the visitors in Africa also, in a way, together with some of the African hosts in, in Sunnyville, Pretoria, cultivate there, right? You make that point in your uh, article also very clearly. Thank you very much then for the three speakers. And um, it's been a sort of, it's been a, a long wait for all those of you who have uh, questions and comments and for discussion. Um, we have been getting some through the chat and uh, the chat of course is also bilingual or trilingual. Um, so perhaps a brief uh, uh, consideration of how we best do this. Um, I can pick up on the English posted chats and I saw one, maybe should I pick up on that one first? Um, and I would maybe also ask all of our speakers to show themselves again. So Odur also, could you come up so that we basically have our virtual round table together here, the four of us, the three speakers and myself. I'm very tempted to comment and have lots of questions, but I will refrain from that, of course. Um, we have, so I'll pick up on one post here and I have to move up. Yes, 
we have uh, one question here by Nadia Christina Schneider, who asks uh, Reginald Ud Odur to elaborate on his own concept of, of a culturally based federation in Kenya, because in a sense, I think that was the concluding point of the outlook, right, of Odur's presentation, um, looking forward and based on his own experience and, if, and his own work, of course. So maybe we could start there and my colleagues will bring in the Spanish and Portuguese questions and we continue from there. Thank you. Can you see me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Right, I'll try and be brief so that we can have as many questions as possible. Um, the, firstly, uh, I proceed uh, from the premise that uh, Kenya is not a nation. The word nation, you cannot get a nation out of colonial violence. And what we call nations are colonial territories turned into independent states, but independence is flags and national anthems, but not freedom. In, in fact, somebody has said, before colonization, we were free. After colonization, we were independent. And that difference is vast. And uh, yet we cannot go back to what we were before we were uh, invaded and uh, dispossessed. But what we can do is to allow people in their local spaces to govern their local issues in line with their own worldviews. And it is in that sense that I advocate um, culturally based um, federalism, which would involve uh, aspects such as um, an upper house, as I said, uh, occupied by leaders of cultural groups, uh, which would involve uh, things like um, shared executive so that we do not just have this winner takes it all in presidential elections, which only ensure that like in the Kenyan situation, only the five big uh, cultural groups and really two or three can ever capture the presidency. So we have uh, a shared executive because like right now we've had uh, four presidents, uh, three of whom have only come from one cultural group. Uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the other one, which is uh, likely to capture the presidency, is also another large group. Uh, I would also say that apart from a shared um, executive, uh, we could have local governments structured differently according to the preferences of the various peoples. Some peoples had their indigenous systems that had uh, uh, chiefs, others who had uh, um, what you called um, councils of elders, and others had governance which were extremely home-based in terms of clans, giving them enough space to op 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 uh, organize their local environment to, the, to a reasonable extent in ways uh, that make sense to them. I would still uh, propose that we have a Bill of Rights that protects the individual from undue bullying by their cultural groups, because some individuals may prefer not to go along with that. And cultural groups, we must admit, can be extremely uh, high-handed. So we would also have a Bill of Rights. Uh, we would also have in the constitution, which like in Kenya we already have, but it is nominal, the opportunity, the, the right to secede, not, just, not so that people can secede, but to encourage central government uh, to, to be responsive to their, to, to their needs and therefore make secession uh, unnecessary. I could go on and on, but if you look on at YouTube and look for Reginald Odour on models of African uh, uh, models of democracy in Africa, there is a talk I gave at Rice University in which I give more details on that. And you can also find two write-ups of mine, one called Kenya Beyond Liberal Democracy. Um, it is not an, an academic article, but it's a feature article where I give more details on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Odua, and also for the question. I'll now make a place for my colleague, Juliana, to uh, um, address uh, a couple of questions 
to Flavia Rios. And I just wanted to part with the observation that the one picture that Flavia showed us, Nairobi, is actually on the university campus that uh, our colleague Reginald uh, Udur is going to every day. And I know it very well myself. So that was very nice to see. And with that, That's I pass nice. over to Juliana briefly. Yeah. Eu vou ler as perguntas em português, apesar da Flávia já ter conseguido vê-las em português, as pessoas conseguem ter a tradução simultânea para o inglês. A primeira pergunta... Deixa eu baixar aqui. É a do Nicolas Bassa, é, e ele direciona a pergunta à professora Flávia. É, eu queria saber se você poderia falar um pouco mais sobre os conceitos, principal, como principalmente o da americanidade como ele está sendo usado nos movimentos contemporâneos, pensando tanto no seu potencial de contranarrativa aos mitos raciais da nação e na pos posicionalidade feminista. Mas, de repente, também, como você tem mencionado, no que diz respeito à pos posição antiimperialista e anticapitalista da Lélia Gonzalez. E aí eu junto essa pergunta do Nicolas com a da, El da Elis, que também é direcionada a Flávia, é, para saber um pouco mais sobre o conceito da americanidade, destacando sua contribuição para pensar a convivialidade entre diferentes indivíduos e grupos no contexto de importantes desigualdades que marca a, que marca a sociedade brasileira, ou como o conceito de americanidade nos ajuda a pensar em como viver juntos em um mundo cada vez mais desigual. E num bloco de perguntas, essas duas foram direcionadas para a Flávia, tem mais uma pergunta, que eu já faço todas que estão em português, e a gente faz uma roda de, de respostas, que é do José Rodrigues, que agradece pelo evento, e ele ficou curioso para ouvir mais é, sobre a fala do professor Rodu, a respeito das soluções institucionais defendidas por autores e autoras africanas, como aqui foi mencionado o Modiola, para promover o convívio entre as diversas comunidades. Ele queria entender mais sobre essa linha de pensamento. Obrigada. Yes, maybe Flavia Rios can Gracias. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Oh. Ok. Uh, eu queria... Obrigada pelas perguntas, é, muito importantes, interessantes. É, eu queria dizer que o pensamento da Lélia Gonzalez pode ser inserido numa teoria complexa do social. Me parece que é uma, uma teoria... É, interseccional decolonial que observa e entende, tem como fundamento a necessidade de analisar os fenômenos sociais a partir de múltiplas dimensões. É, neste sentido, a autora desenvolve hum, duas linhas é, é, o que torna o seu pensamento muito próximo de outras autoras é, interseccionais é, e decoloniais no mundo. O primeiro lado do seu pensamento refere-se sobre uma interpretação complexa do social, da vida social, das, da organização social e dos sistemas. De outro lado, uma leitura sobre justiça social, sobre convivência, sobre a possibilidade de transformação, de insurgências. O, o pensamento da Lélia Gonzalez é, tem por base uma complexidade muito grande de autores de diferentes continentes. É, eu já falei para vocês da influência da Angela Davis, refiro-me também aqui a Du Bois, Franz Fanon, a Milka Cabral, 
uh, Walter Rodney e outros autores da teoria da, da dependência, autores brasileiros. É, Gonzales tinha uma preocupação feminista, é, um ponto feminista fundamental, estruturante da sua reflexão. Portanto, uma teoria decolonial ou anticolonial não poderia ser sem uma visão radical do feminismo. Não um feminismo eurocentrado, mas um feminismo construído a partir das visões, das perspectivas, da produção intelectual, cultural de mulheres, especialmente indígenas e afrodescendentes. Neste sentido, a categoria de americanidade é uma categoria é, que pode ser inserida nesta teoria mais ampla do complexo, so que refere-se a as origens e as transformações. É como uma dialética de uma origem de dominação e exploração, mas também uma potencialidade de subversão e transformação. Gonzales tinha este, esta é, perspectiva de uma teoria que explicasse, mas também transformasse, o que é comum nos autores do século XX, XIX e XX. É, a Lélia é a teoria da americanidade nem sempre é bem interpretada, porque pensam alguns que é sobre ser negro, não é com ser, ser negro, é, é uma categoria anticolonial, transcende etnicidades, transcende racialidades, uh, transcende uh, nacionalidades e, e transcende também uma perspectiva hemisférios. Então, Gonzales uh, traz essa categoria como uh, uma contribuição intelectual às teorias da diáspora. Então, a mefricanidade é uma categoria diaspórica, é uma categoria anti-essencialista, não é uma teoria da identidade uma, como essência, mas é uma teoria para o enfrentamento das essências, das essências políticas e das essências coloniais. É, então, a mefricanidade trata sobre as populações desta região das Américas, de modo geral, e se recusa às imposições é, norte-americanas sobre o que seriam as teorias é, de liberdade ou de afirmação cultural e étnica é, desde as populações negras. É, a Lélia Gonzalez tem tido uma recepção importante nos movimentos sociais contemporâneos, é, nem sempre os movimentos contemporâneos estão completamente é, influenciados pelo pensamento dela, há novas interpretações, novas leituras, é, muitas dessas interpretações são reducionistas, são às vezes essencialistas, coisa que não era do pensamento da autora, o essencialismo, é, mesmo racial ou étnico. A autora entendia que as construções étnicas e culturais e raciais eram instrumentos de luta política, mas não para enclausurar grupos, é, indivíduos na sociedade. É, eu diria que hoje... Ah, os movimentos sociais têm explorado muitas categorias da autora, porque o Brasil ficou, e a América Latina também, conhecia pouco a Lélia Gonzalez e outras pessoas no mundo. A Lélia Gonzalez tem sido recepcionada na França, a tradução desse seu texto sobre a mefricanidade está em, espanhol, em francês, acabou de ser traduzido para o espanhol, e muitas universidades, estudantes latino-americanos têm lido Lélia Gonzalez, têm estudado a Lélia Gonzalez por encontrar nessa autora uma criatividade, uma forma específica de elaborar uma teoria sobre o social, sobre a região, com esse caráter emancipatório e comprometido com as lutas de base social, 
nas cidades, nos meios urbanos, nas regiões mais distantes, isso é dos centros urbanos, então esse é um ponto importante. A outra, é, para finalizar, é, eu diria que a, a ideia de americanidade também questiona um purismo é, racial europeu, porque Lélia Gonzalez pressupõe que essa dimensão ladina, da métrica ladina, é, refere-se a uma a península ibérica, no caso é, Portugal Espanha, como já sendo populações que viveram e sofreram as influências é, africanas e árabes. Então, já são sociedades em, em transformação e não com uma superioridade de grupo europeu e etc. Então, todas as categorias da, da Lélia Gonzalez são anti-essencialistas nesse sentido. Agradeço, as, eu fiz aqui um balanço dos comentários e eu sei que os meus colegas é, precisam também falar. Obrigada, Kai, pela mediação. Thank you very much for those explanations and deliberations. Um, we have, uh, I think, uh, Odur waiting for to answer to the question addressed to him. Okay. Uh, well, I, I hope you heard me in my previous answer. I, I thought my mic might have been off. Was it on the previous answer? What? Let's... I hope, okay. uh, yeah, what happened is my mic uh my audio confused me a bit so i hope the last time i spoke you heard yes yes we heard you clearly. Ah, great now I, I will answer this one about mojola mojola is talking about um radical decentralization and our our friend uh is asking how that might uh, promote conviviality and i would just reply that conviviality does not have anything to do with uh, the size of a uh, polity or the, the size of, of, of the units of a polity. Conviviality comes through uh, the building of trust, the building of mutual acceptance. Let me just say, for example, Kenya has been highly centralist, a uh, strong central government. And the official narrative is we are one people, we are one nation, but the practice is um, um, political mobilization along cultural lines. I am stopping to use the word ethnic because I have uh, realized that the, the Icelanders are only 300,000, but they are a nation, while the Yoruba are millions and are an, and are an ethnic group. So that too is a, is a colonial category. But the, the ethnic groups, uh, as they were called, and the cultural ones, as I call them now. When any of them captures power, that group then um, uh, appoints its own people, the elite of that group appoint their own members to plumb jobs. And when the others question, they're told, oh, well, those two are Kenyans, we are one nation. So then we have a, a, a hypocritical public discourse of unity and a reality of marginalization and exclusion. Uh, and therefore, decentralization would sort out that to an extent where every unit would, uh, would feel like in our own space, we have some element of cultural homogeneity and we can share whatever resources are available a little more fairly. Of course, inside those units, there is also re no real uh, homogeneity. So the struggles uh, continue, if not within cultural groups, then within clans. But the other thing I would like to remind us is the fact that the boundaries we have right now are extremely traumatic. And my classical example is we had a vice president in Kenya called Moody Awori, and his brother, was a member of parliament in Uganda. Why? Because their ancestral land was split up by the Berlin Conference so that they belong to exactly one family and to exactly two states. And this kind of situation was sanctioned by the Organization of African Unity, 
which uh, resolved that they would not tamper with colonial boundaries. Therefore, this is why I was talking about the distinction between independence and, and, and freedom. What then we have is that the African states are just municipal councils within a large uh, super state uh, manned by the United Nations and so on. In fact, one of the things I wanted to ask is what would happen if, for example, countries decided they no longer wanted to be part of the UN? Is that question thinkable? But I hope I have given some indication of the thoughts of my mentor, Mojola, about decentralization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Odor. Um, there's been one question uh, sent through us uh, to us through the chat, um, which is ad addressed to Sanya and Sanya's talk. So I'm going to read it out. Um, and then we will have a couple of questions from within our panel here based in Berlin in the Hanak House. But uh, so, so this question is from Shirin Amiyamuazami from Berlin also. She says, thanks for your very insightful contributions. Could any of you perhaps elaborate if and how, and I take this now to be anyone to be Sanya because it's directed to Sanya's talk, elaborate if and how the concept of Ubuntu as deployed in contemporary African thought addresses the racial injustices which Sanya most clearly spoke of. And uh, in some ways, I think uh, maybe Sanya had also more to say on that, but I, we had to cut him a bit. Um, time was pressing. So Sanya, please. Thank you so much, Karl. And thanks uh, for that uh, very interesting question, quite important. Um, but I think I'd like to break the questions in stages to see how even the concept of Ubuntu um, could be um, used. We must uh, uh, remind ourselves that the concept Ubuntu is a principle of humanism, a principle of human connection and also reciprocity. But um, in desperate times, you know, there's nothing wrong with the concept. It's a beautiful concept. I, I think it speaks to the universe. It speaks to the human in all of us. It's about recognizing the other in ourselves and recognizing ourselves in the other. So it's 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 it's, a, it's a, like I said, like I said, it's a it's a principle, it's a, um, a concept of human connection. So by itself, there's nothing wrong with the principle. So what, in, what we find is that in terms of implementation, when we want to implement it, when we want to leave it, the concept in our everyday lives, then it, we, we find all kinds of challenges, challenges that come from um, inequality, racial injustice as a question addressed, economic injustice in, or inequality, desperation, all kinds of stuff. Um, problems and challenges. So, it, it got, um, uh, for instance, I, I wanted to mention a scourge in South Africa, which I didn't have, to, uh, I didn't have enough time to mention. The, the scourge of gender-based violence in which South African male partners basically abuse and often murder their domestic partners. And this is a scourge. Now, fortunately, we're having um, we started this 16-day activism against women and violence. It started recently, was launched by President Cyril Ramaphosa to remind ourselves, especially South Africans, of the need to protect women and children and to keep them safe in their homes, on the streets, wherever they choose to be, and to ensure that we um, that their rights are protected. Their, Safety is safeguarded, but you know, all the time we keep we are reminded of by horrible incidents of the need of this necessity to you know the gender-based violence in a context where um, Ubuntu operates and it's and it's uh, and is a you know a reality. You wouldn't have. Um, gender-based violence. You wouldn't have all those horror stories of, um, of partners murdering and sometimes butchering, um, quartering their, their domestic um, partners. You wouldn't have such. such. It, it, it is clear that it's the implementation of 
the concept that we encounter problems. I remember um, um, press, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu throwing his, his arms up in, in despair during one of the serious xenophobic um, outbursts in South Africa. Say, well, why, what were we talking? Why are we even mentioning Ubuntu? We must forget about it. We don't practice it. We don't, you know, it doesn't mean anything because if it meant something, you wouldn't treat your fellow human being that way. Not to talk about South Africans, how to South Africans treat themselves. But I, but what I also try to do in my talk is to present the dread, very desperate circumstances in which South Africans find themselves in contemporary times, com com compounded by a host of problems, a host of, um, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's how I'd respond to a very interesting question. Thank you very much, Sanya. Now we have uh, a couple of speakers' questions from inside here listed up, and they will, yeah, I ask them to speak now and briefly introduce themselves, basically, and then, thanks. Hi. I'm Ira Sema. Um, that was not Ubuntu-like. If I turn on, yeah. So I'm asking her to come over here. Um, bodily three-dimensional communication does work best. Um, so. So oh, hi, I'm Irasema Belli. I'm a fellow at the ICI Berlin. And um, actually my question um, is in a kind of continuation with um, Sanya's comment. Uh, I, I would like to um, ask Reginald whether um, communalism supposes some kind of egalitarianism and so I'm an anthropologist. I do research on central Angola. And um, Linda Haywood, when she's talking about pre-colonial central highlands, she talks about a dialectic between autocracy and democracy to make sense of how power operates in this region. And it's a way in which she makes sense of both this council of people who deliberate on things, which she reads as democratic, and then also of age, gender, status-based hierarchies. I'd be curious to know what you think about that. Um, e para Flávia, eu queria te perguntar... Um... Ah, okay. I can, okay, I'll ask the question in English then. It's very simple. I'd like to ask you about um, the place of Fanon and Césaire in uh, Lelia Gonzalez's uh, work, because um, you talk about uh, a kind of anti-essentialist um, theory in which these like colonial or imperialistic categories would be replaced by this idea of Amefricanidad. So I was wondering how um, this would go together with Fanon and Cezanne. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I could uh, uh, try and do this. I see we have only about three minutes. Uh, um, Regarding um, communalism and egalitarianism, and then you do mention the issue of autocracy versus democracy. First and foremost, I would say not every uh, monarchical society is autocratic. Presumably Britain is uh, democratic, although it has a monarch. Uh, and, and I rarely hear anybody having a problem with that. So there is a, a, a volume uh, a Companion to African Philosophy, edited by the Ghanaian philosopher Kwasi Miredu, and in there, 
you have some two articles or uh, chapters, one by uh, we read uh, one by uh, uh, Wamala. No, it's actually one article, one chapter by Wamala, where he demonstrates that there was a lot of democracy in the Baganda King, Uganda Kingdom, so that the, the monarch was not an absolute monarch. Um, uh, egalitarianism and communalism are not necessarily uh, synonymous, but communalism does uh, affirm that every person deserves to be treated with dignity. However, uh, other factors come into play like primogeniture, where the, the elder usually in a typical traditional society, the elder enjoy more privileges and more respect than the younger. Uh, but the, the fact that in communalism, uh, people see each other as family uh, is intended to regulate the excesses such as the ones that we see in an avowedly capitalist environment. Um, uh, so, so that is what I would say about that. Thank you. Um, é, obrigada pela pergunta. É, o pensamento da Lélia Gonzalez tem múltiplas influências. E no que diz respeito aos autores anticoloniais, o debate anticolonial de origem francófona, é, especialmente do Caribe, é bastante influente, tanto o Caribe francófono como anglófono, como Walter Rodney, são autores um, muito importantes para o pensamento da Gonzalez. Não podemos dizer que o pensamento da Gonzalez, de americanidade, se reduz às teorias uh, decoloniais ou anticoloniais, tal como formuladas por Messezé ou François Fanon, é, mas é, a influência desses autores podem, as influências podem ser vistas, citadas, são citadas nos textos, ah, como a, pensando a centralidade dos processos de racialização no, no mundo colonial, em particular o Fanon é um autor que, por seu vínculo com a psicanálise, e a psicanálise era muito importante no pensamento da Gonzalez, ajudam a autora a pensar sobre processos de internalização da subordinação, a internalização das categorias coloniais, a subjetivação das categorias de opressão e de inferioridade. Então, esses autores, especialmente Fanon, colaboraram para que ela compreendesse o poder da internalização da opressão, não apenas os seus aspectos econômicos, políticos, culturais, externos ao indivíduo, mas na sua dimensão mais profunda e subjetiva. Então, as, é, esses autores foram muito importantes é, para esse tipo de explicação que vai ter lugar na construção da ideia de americanidade, de racismo por denegação e todos os outros conceitos que ela vai elaborar no seu pensamento. Obrigada. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, very much Flavia and Udur, for your answers. And uh, unfortunately, time has already run out, and uh, we had some more people queuing up. Um, but uh, for today. Uh, time is over and it's been um, illuminating to listen in, um, to see trajectories of, of potential overlappings to be explored more. I just want to perhaps indicate that Sanya in his talk had one explicitly transcontinental pointer as well, where the Ubuntu was related not just to Southern Africa, but Western Africa and going from the Yoruba semantic field over to the Afro-Cuban. So this is one explicit pointer that will bridge us over to tomorrow's conversations between the continents. And so we have many open questions and open pathways. Um, 
the conversations to be continued for sure. And this will happen tomorrow in our next two panels, starting tomorrow afternoon from 3, uh, 2 30 p.m. German time. It remains for me to say also in the name of my co-organizers, a big, big thank you. In Swahili, we say Asante Nisana. Um, to you, particularly the speakers, thank you for your great presentations. And also a big thank you to the translators, because that is a really strenuous job. <laughs> and I think they did fantastically. Thank you everyone for participating, for listening and contributing to the questions and discussions and hope to see and hear you all tomorrow afternoon. Thanks again and to the different spaces where you are. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.